for everyone who's here, uh, all protocols observed. I am very pleased uh, to introduce a fellow engineer, engineer Irene Itobio, who's a senior petroleum um, industry analyst with OPEC. And her presentation is entitled OPEC's World Oil Outlook for 2021. Kindly give um, engineer Irene a hand, and please, we are welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to use um, this opportunity to thank the organizers of this event for taking the initiative to make this premier event laudable and grand against all odds. My profound gratitude goes to the uh, Chief Executive Officer the, of the African Energy Chamber, Comrade Ayuk, uh, for making my dream a reality. A reality that finally, Af the African energy sector is finally rising up to live out the true meaning of his creed. I want to thank NJ again. It's a privilege to be at this historical event. Distinguished, uh, your excellencies, distinguished uh, guests and ladies and gentlemen, today I will be providing a brief overview of the world, uh, the world Oil Outlook 2021. It's an OPEC flagship annual publication launched on 28th September each year. It examines development in energy and oil demand. It, it examines development in energy and oil demand, oil supply and refining. It also looks at the global economy, policy and technology developments demographic trends, as well as environmental issues and sustainable development. This year's World Oil Outlook again underscores the seismic changes that the world has undergone as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. It provides an in-depth review and analysis of the global oil and energy industries and offers a thorough assessment of various sensitivities in the medium and long-term development of the oil industry. Once again, it is important to reiterate that the outlook is not about making predictions. No one has a crystal ball. The outlook should be viewed as a helpful and insightful reference tool, one that underscores the organization's commitment to knowledge sharing and data transparency. Today, I will be presenting using the following outline on the next slides. Please, the outline slides, please. It is important to note that our data is based on assumptions that will be projected. Can you go on to the next slide? The key assumption slides. The key, the next slide. Those, uh, pro the projection there is a, uh, our key assumption uh, for this uh, data that uh, I'll be presenting to you. The next slide, please. The next slide. Expected projections on global GDP between 2020 to 2045 is an average of rate of 3.1%. Among the developing countries, India will see the fastest growth at 6.2%, followed by China, at 4%, and then the Middle East and Africa at 3.9%. Yeah. Okay. The projected global average income is to rise from $16,000 in 2020 to over $28,000 by 2045, and OECD Americas region will remain the highest in terms of GDP per capita while Middle East and Africa will be the lowest at less than $10,000 GDP per capita by 2045. The next slide will take us to global energy demand. What is clear is that the world will need more energy in the decades to come. In the period to 2045, the global economy is estimated to more than double. World population is set to, be, to expand at 9 0.5 billion. And we need to remember that there is huge potential for socioeconomic development in terms of expanding access to modern energy services. For those billions who continue to 
go without access to electricity and clean cooking. We see global energy demand expanding by 28% by 2045. Energy will be needed to power more homes, more services, more businesses, more cars, more planes, more ships. The list can go on. This will require the use of all forms of energy to support the post-pandemic recovery. The energy transition, the ener to, to, to support the post-pandemic recovery, the energy transition, and address long-term energy needs. We need to draw on the strength of all energy forms. From a regional perspective, we see a continuing energy demand growth, tr demand growth trend toward the non-OECD, with its share expected to rise from 63% today to 71% by 2045. In fact, the entire growth in energy demand is expected to come from the non-OECD. Forecasts have shown that natural gas will displace coal as the second largest fuel share in the energy mix. This, with increase seen in both OECD and non-OECD countries, it is set to increase from 64.2 million barrels of oil per day in 2020 to 85.7 million barrels per day by 2045. This represents 24.4% of global primary energy mix in 2045. However, non-OECD we account for over 65% share of natural gas demand by the end of uh, outlook period. Renewables witness the largest growth, rising from a global first share of around 2% in 2020 to over 10% by 2045. It is important to note that OPEC member countries are making significant investment in renewables as they look to di diversify their energy mix. Gas sees the second largest growth driven in, in part by the high, higher urbanization rate, industrial demand, and the competitiveness over coal in power generation. In fact, all energies are set to witness growth, with the exception of coal. It is oil, however, that retains its number one position in the energy mix. It is still expected to provide 28% of global energy needs by 2045. The developed countries emitted only about three times more energy-related CO2 emissions per capita than developing countries in 2020. Although the emission is expected to decline by the end of the outlook period, it is important to note that emissions are stable at around 3 trillion CO2 in line with rising population in developing, in developing countries. Global energy poverty will continue to decline although the gap between the OECD and the non-OECD uh, countries narrows, there is still a significant difference between these regions. However, India and China will have the highest energy consumption and the GDP growth rate over the forecast period. The next slide will take us to uh, all demand. Given the huge 9.3 million barrel drop in global oil demand in 2020, Incremental demand by 2026 is almost 14 million barrels of oil per day, higher than 2020. About only 4.4 million barrels of oil per day, higher than in 2029. Long-term oil demand growth slows over the outlook period, and total demand reaches just over 108 uh, million barrels of oil per day by 2045. Following the energy trend, it is, it is the non-OECD, CD uh, countries that dominate all demand growth, led by India, China, other Asian countries, OPEC, and Africa. The OECD sees a steady decline from oil uh, uh, in the mid 2020s onward. By, by sector, road transportation leads the way, followed by aviation and petrochemicals why electricity generation is the only area expected to see an oil demand decline. While travel and mobility restrictions due to pandemic hit the transportation sector hard, particularly aviation, the long-term picture remains one of robust growth. There remains huge potential for an expansion in the, in the passenger and commercial vehicles fleet, especially in the developing regions, with lower motorization rates and promising economic prospects. 
from the aviation perspective, there remain near-term challenges, specifically continuing restrictions and changes to consumer behavior. But in the long term, robust GDP growth in developing countries, expanding population, and a larger middle class expected to lead to an increasing number of flights. It should be noted that the continued efficiency drive in internal combustion engines will not reduce consumption, but also reduce emissions further. The next slide will take us to uh, liquid supplies. On the supply side, non-OPEC liquid supply is set to continue the recovery witnessed in 2021. It is forecast to expand by 7.5 million barrels of oil per day in 2020 and to uh, 70.4 million barrels per day by 2026, driven by the U.S. tight oil, as well as barrels from Brazil, Russia, Guyana, Canada, and Kazakhstan. Beyond the medium term, non-OPEC liquid peak in the late 2020s, in line with the U.S. tight oil, then slowly declined to 65.5 million barrels of oil per day by 2045. In fact, non-OPEC liquids is forecast to be at the same level in 2045 as it's, it was in 2019. There are a handful of sources that lead to non-OPEC growth in the long term, such as Brazil, Guyana, Canada, and Russia. Why others such as the US, Norway, and China are expected to witness a decline? It means that OPEC liquids, which recovers to pre-pandemic levels around 2025, rise strongly thereafter. It reaches a level of nearly 43 million barrels of oil per day in 2045. In terms of market share, it implies an increase from 33% in 2020 to 39% by 2045. Now let's move to refining. In terms of the downstream, estimated crude distillation capacity addition in the medium term are a robust uh, 6.9 million barrels of oil per day while another 7.1 million barrels of oil incremental capacity is required in the long term, predominantly in developing countries. Most additions will be located in Asia, Pacific, and the Middle East, and Africa. At the same time, developed regions are likely to see only minor additions as demand in this country declines. Moreover, refining capacity closures of around 4.5 million barrels of oil by day between 2020 and 2026 uh, will be seen mostly in developed countries. It, it will also help to balance out the downstream market in the medium term. On top of this, significant additions of secondary capacity are expected over the forecast period. 7.1 million barrels of oil conversion units, 16.7 million barrels per day of desulfurization desuffer, capacity, and 4.1 million barrels per day of octane units. It is important to know that uh, the effect above projection there must be a certain level of investment we must see in the next slide. The key to the industrial expansion is investment. This year's world oil outlook shows that investment of $11.8 trillion will be required between now and 2045 in the upstream, midstream, and downstream sectors. To place this in some further context, Upstream capital expenditure fell by around 30% in 2020 as a result of the impact of the pandemic, and this follows drops of 27% in both 2015 and 2016. Let me stress that the return of investment is a core objective of the Declaration of Cooperation. The investment requirement clearly underlines that any talk of, of the oil and gas industry being concerned to the past and of the need to halt new investment in oil and gas is wrong-headed. If the necessary investments are not made, it will have knock-on implication as viewed in current gas developments in Europe and elsewhere around the world, leaving long-term scars not only for producers but consumers too. We are witnessing strains and conflicts related to energy affordability, energy security, and reducing emissions. Focusing on only one of these issues while ignoring the others can lead to unintended consequences such as market distortions and price volatility. This has been evident in recent weeks and more so in recent days. It is not in the interest of either producers or consumers. We, are, we, we also have some levels of uncertainties that may stall our projection. Let's see 
uh, those uncertainties in the next slides. The outlook also underscores significant uncertainties for the supply and demand outlooks. For example, alternative GDP growth trajectories create a range of demand uncertainty of almost 13 million barrels of oil per day by 2045. Additional policy measures supporting faster fuel substitution and penetration of more efficient technology could push global oil demand below 100 million barrels of oil per day by 2045. And on the supply side, risks are heavily skewed to, to the downside. As we all appreciate the global future, it is also, it is all, there is also a need to focus on shrinking global emissions, alleviating energy poverty, and finding a sustainable way forward that delivers for each and every person on this planet. It is vital to tackle both climate change and energy poverty within the context of sustainable development and the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals with the SDG 7, calling for universal and sustainable energy access. The energy transition should not be about picking one energy over another. It needs to be driven by science, industry facts, and hard data. As I mentioned earlier, this means embracing all energies and keeping our hearts on both energy security and reducing emission. It is important to note that in all of this, Africa will play a major role in supporting higher economic growth in the long term. And all demand could be as high as 12 million barrels of oil per day by 2045. And these are my takeaways. Because of time, uh, everything I've said, I just summarized in these two slides. Uh, because of time, I may not be able to go through them, but I would like uh, for the technical team to project a very short video of the summary of the, uh, this year's World Oil Outlook. Please, the, the technical team. 2021 has seen the rollout of a suite of COVID-19 vaccines, providing hope that the world can overcome the pandemic and its fallout. Oil markets have stabilized, with demand now expected to reach pre-pandemic levels in 2022, and non-OPEC supply set to see relatively robust growth from next year. OPEC members and countries of the Declaration of Cooperation, after successfully helping return stability to markets and drawing down the stock overhang, in July 2021 decided to extend the framework of adjustments until the end of 2022 to help ensure continuing stability. After the recovery in 2022, global oil demand is expected to grow further to 104.4 million barrels per day by 2026. In the long term, oil demand continues to expand but at a slower pace, reaching just over 108 million barrels per day in 2035 and remaining at this level until 2045. From 2022, non-OPEC supply recovery picks up pace growing 7.5 million barrels per day in the medium term as US tight oil comes back and countries including Brazil, the Russian Federation, Guyana, Canada and Kazakhstan see production rise. Non-OPEC supply peaks around 2030, concurrently with a high point in US tight oil. In turn, OPEC liquids, after recovering to around 34 million barrels per day in the medium term, rise steadily to reach 43 million barrels per day in the long term. Estimated refining capacity additions in the medium term are robust at almost 7 million barrels per day, while another 7 million barrels per day of incremental capacity will be required in the long term, predominantly in developing countries. This will be partly offset by expected significant capacity closures in developed regions, where oil demand is set to decline. Cumulative upstream, midstream and downstream investment requirements in the long term are $11.8 trillion in the period until 2045. Providing this investment in a timely manner is essential for both producers and consumers. In the wider energy perspective, oil will remain the number one fuel in the energy mix until 2045, even though wind and solar energy will see by far the highest growth in this time frame. However, questions around evolving policies and technologies 
mean that the long-term energy outlook remains uncertain. What does remain certain is that the global population will expand and economies will grow. Coupled with ambitions to address energy poverty and provide energy access for all, this means that demand for energy will rise significantly. Now in its seventh decade, OPEC is steadfast in its commitment to ensuring secure and stable oil supplies and working with stakeholders everywhere to support a sustainable and inclusive energy future. Thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity to present the World Oil Outlook. I look forward to your questions and continuing the discussion today and in the future. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I understand that we have two ministers that are joining us, and I thought it would only be it would be remiss if we postponed this um, this session. So, can we at least have maybe 15 minutes with them? Is that okay with everyone? Uh, Yolisa, are the ministers here, please? May I'm right here, Elizabeth Rogo. Can you hear me? Where All right, you? I can hear you. I'm right here, Elizabeth. Okay. Oh, there you are. All yes, right. He... I found a lost minister. He is here. <laughs> Which is the lost one? That the doctor... one from Ghana. Ah, Dr. Min. He, he, How are he you? He was right. He's saying, where's the one from Equatorial Guinea? <laughs> oh, there he is. So he, Please, he, gentlemen, he, welcome. They're here. Welcome, we, we welcome. We know how to find the lost sheep. Okay. The, I like two, two found sheep better than no sheep. So that's fine. Uh, Minister Gabriel, Lima, please, co please come on stage. He is coming. <laughs> and we are having here Dr. Mohammed Amin. I'll tell you a little story. We're supposed to have met up with Dr. Amin in Ghana, 2020. Uh, but Dr. Amin... You had a meeting at the last minute. <laughs> so we finally met here in Cape Town. So uh, we're very, very happy for this. But I think we can go ahead and um, His Excellencies, Gabriel Obiang from Equatorial Guinea, thank you very much for joining us. And His Excellency, Dr. Mohammed Amin from, uh, uh, from Ghana, who's the deputy Minister of Energy. They will be joined with, uh, uh, by engineer Irene, who gave a, a wonderful presentation. So, gentlemen, are we ready? We're ready, excellent. So, our topic today was um, the developing, developing the African petroleum markets value chain. And that may seem to be a rather strange question, especially for you, um, Minister Gabriel since Equatorial Guinea has been in the oil and gas uh, play for, for quite a while. The question I'd like to start off is, when we talk about um, market value chain, that's upstream, midstream, and downstream, uh, why Africa and why now? Doctor, I mean, Minister Gabriel? I like the doctor thing. So. Thank you, okay, we'll add doctor. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> Um, <laughs> even though in Ghana they call me professor. Eh? Oh, oh we'll, call, we'll call you professor now. Okay, professor, no please. Okay, um, first of all, uh, I do apologize if I have arrived a little bit late. Um, we are engaged in many on-site discussions and um, meetings, and this is the main reason that we have the conference. It's not just to, to speak, but also have an opportunity to meet with possible investors in the country. Now, um, I, I want to thank you for the presentation, for the question. Um, my, my view is the following, and I usually say when there is a problem, there is also an opportunity. Yes. Um, the current situation that we are having right now, even though a lot of people see it as a major problem, uh, we don't see uh, problems. Um, I'll give you an example. Companies have been in countries in West Africa for a long time. Um, call it sitting on blocks, doing operations, not thinking and moving. And we have right now a, a, a great opportunity because some of those companies are deciding, listen, we are 
thinking that because of different outside sources, we need to reduce our investment, we need to move forward. And some people will panic. They will say, you know, the Americans, the Chinese, the Europeans, they are leaving. You know, what we are going to do? And, and, and the other comment that I usually make is that when a door closes on you, rather than just being focusing on that door that closed, next to it, that's another door that have opened. So what we have at this stage in, in Africa is that we also have come to a realization that somebody needs to be responsible of our destiny. And for the first time, we need to actually take responsibility of that destiny. And I'll give you an example because it's what happened with COVID. And I have to thank COVID not for the infection for the death, but something in our industry happened that it really make us realize that we are ready. When the lockdown started, all the flight stopped, all the movement of material stopped, and many of the experts that we were saying they were experts that we couldn't live without them, couldn't fly. So I have like four installations by ExxonMobil have three installations, and Trident have two, one FPSO and one and two TLPs, one TLP and two XPSO, and we have uh, Chevron with one uh, FPSO2. But we have a situation in which the expat couldn't arrive to Equatorial Guinea. And for the first time, I have to call all the executive and I ask them a question. We are stuck in Equatorial Guinea. There is not international flights. Can we actually continue the operations just with the nationals in Malabo? And I have to give credit, the first one who raised the hand and said was actually the country manager of ExxonMobil. And he said, Excellency, yes. And it was actually very interesting because for five months, Equatorial Guinea was operating all their installation with almost 80 to 90% by nationals. And some of the expats who were stuck there too. Of course, internet and communication helped because the expats who couldn't travel were able to, to communicate with it, but our installation were operated by our own people. When for many years they said Equatorial Guinea could not operate the installations. So it was actually thanks to COVID that we discovered that because even our, di our directors traveled to Ghana and saw what Ghanaians did. And I have to, not because my brother is here, we need to give a lot of credit what Ghana have done. I say with all my heart because we have been operating for a long time. Other African countries, maybe I won't name them because they won't like that. But Ghana came after us. They actually did the development plan. They planned the local content. And if you see what Tulo and the Ghanaian have done, it's almost 100% run by Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. And I'm very jealous. I went there, I sent my directors, and my directors said, Excellency, we need to work. <laughs> what Ghana have done is amazing. So I think, I don't, I don't worry about this transition. I don't worry about banks saying that uh, they are not coming or they are not investing. Because actually, it's, it's good. I mean, sometimes when you have a bicycle and you fall, that's good because it teaches you that you need to do balance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What we need to make a decision is that we need to be responsible of our future. We need to operate our own installations. And if Chinese run FPSO, Vietnamese run FPSO, Venezuelans and the rest, and I can guarantee you they are no more intelligent than us, we could actually do the same thing. So my view is that the next phase for Africa is for us to take responsibility of our own ass assets, and start running, and not just think about doing explorations, exporting the oil, but think about how to process it. So, and to do that, we need to learn from our, our brothers and sisters, and, and that's the next phase of Africa. If they are not gonna come to do that, we're gonna have to do it ourselves. Thank you, and if I may call you Professor Gabriel. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Min Akwaba, I can at least say Ghana is my home, because I am married in Ghana. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you have anything to add? Of course, to that? Uh, uh, Minister Gabriel is, is our guru. <laughs> 
we just don't call him our professor, he's also our guru, because he's given us lectures upon lectures, and uh, we've always listened to him, and he's helping make a greater impact in Ghana. Uh, I, I, I think I need to also mention that the, the Chinese that built our gas processing uh, facility had to leave at some point, and everybody thought that uh, there was going to be disaster uh, in Ghana, but I can tell you that the very week that they left, Ghanaians took over the operation of the gas processing facility. And we are talking about expanding the processing facility with another train, which will be operated by Ghanaians. We've built uh, reasonable uh, levels of capacity uh, sufficient to uh, operate uh, these uh, processing facilities. But listening to the, the presentation, I, I became so hopeful that there is not just potential for Africa to develop our petroleum markets value chain, but we have to start doing it. As Minister Gibral said, we have to start doing it. We have done something, but if we make the effort to develop our capacity, we will be able to do that. In, in, the, in the outlook that uh, was presented, um, the projection is that demand will continue to grow. Demand for crude oil will continue to grow, however marginal uh, it may be. It, it will not be exponential growth as we have seen over the last two decades. But if demand is going to decline, we must find out where is the decline coming from? And are there areas where we can grow demand to neutralize the decline? We've gone through this phase before. When the U.S. increased production of oil and uh, shale gas, you know, um, a large amount of Africa's oil used to find destination in the U.S. This oil found its way to Asia. And, and therefore, if there will be decline in, in, in demand elsewhere, there is potential to grow demand elsewhere. I, I think that Africa should take the destiny in our own hands and grow the demand in Africa. And, and we can grow the demand. There are many drivers of, of demand growth. For example, industrialization. Industrialization in the sense that, I mean, Madame said uh, the demand will still be in transportation, followed by aviation, and followed by petrochemical. This is where we can grow demand. For example, if we talk about producing hydrogen, Hydrogen can be used for transportation in future. It can be used for aviation. But hydrogen itself is not an energy carrier. It is sourced from energy. And so the gas potential that we have, the renewable energy potential that we have, can be used to power the production of hydrogen for us to use in transportation and aviation. When it comes to petrochemicals, I have seen figures that suggest that it's about 12% of current global demand, but it's expected to grow to about a third of demand growth by 2030 and almost half of demand growth by 2050. There is huge potential there, and we have to take advantage of that. Nigeria is leading the way in petrochemical development. Ghana is following. I'm sure you have read about the development of the Ghana Petroleum Hub, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where we're hoping to provide facilities for refining crude, for storing crude, for marketing and distribution of crude and other you know, uh, uh, petrochemicals. We, we, we have made that area a free zone area in order to attract investment so we can export to the rest of, of Africa. So that is one clear area we can, we can grow demand. Another area we can grow demand, and this is very important, is in harnessing our potential to increase power supply. Since yesterday, we have heard that there are about 600 mil million sub-Saharan Africans who do not have access to electricity. There is potential there. If we have to supply electricity to meet this demand, our gas potential is, is there for us to use in generating more power to meet this demand. I don't think we are going to leave these people out because leaving them out means denying them the opportunity for development. 
And if Africa is to develop, energy access should be a priority. And this is where our oil and gas can help us grow the, 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 the market. Then let me finally uh, also talk about uh, increasing uh, consumption. I am very shocked at some of the data I have seen relating to the export of oil by African producers to African consumers, just about 5.2%. <laughs> and so when people say we have to work together, this is where we have to work together. But the reason we haven't been able to do this is lack of infrastructure. We have to build the infrastructure. We have to build our pipeline infrastructure. We have to build our roads so we can use the trucks to convey uh, these products from one country to another. Because some of our countries are landlocked. Some producers are landlocked, such as Chad and Mauritania. Some consumers are landlocked, such as Burkina Faso, Mali, etc., etc. But if we have to ensure that we trade amongst ourselves and increase the amount of oil we export to African consumers in order to increase the demand for our own crude, that infrastructure is critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We may not do it as individual countries, but if we come together, we can build interregional uh, infrastructure, uh, share the use of the infrastructure, similar to what the West Africa Gas Pipeline is doing. Mm -hmm. I have advocated on many platforms that we need to extend the West Africa Gas Pipeline to countries that are closer to us, to Ghana, to Benin, you know, so that we can harness that potential to, to develop gas to uh, power uh, infrastructure to reach out to the the, the millions of our people who do not currently have access to electricity. So these are areas I think there is potential for growing our market, the petroleum market's value chains in Africa, in order for us to benefit and maximize those benefits from, from the extraction of the, the oil that, 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 that we do in, in, in our continent. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to get to you, um, Engineer Irene. You, you did a fantastic presentation, but I just want to uh, touch on two topics that came out of uh, Professor Professor Gabriel, when you mentioned uh, uh, finance and um, and uh, Dr. Min, when you talked about unlocking um, our resources by building infrastructure, and if you want to look at something like the ECOP East Africa Crude Oil Pipeline, which is unique in that in the in East Africa, in that it's crossing um, two two major. Uh, two major countries. So the question I want to raise is, it's all wonderful to be talking about these uh, interconnections, interlocking, but it comes down to money. Professor, tell me, how am I going to get that money? How will I raise that money? Professor, it's for you. Yes. <laughs> you said engineer first, so... No, no, I said, I said engineer, hold on. I wanted you two first to talk. I'll get to engineer. I, I think, I think... You know, it, uh, it depends on the project. You know, um, I cannot speak on East Africa. I can speak a little bit on the area that uh, I do, uh, I do have ma more experience. Yes. I, I think the creation of the market is important. And the best example is what uh, my, my brother have said here, is the petroleum hub that Ghana wants to do. Uh, because one of the key things that the, the money, or, or how to raise the money, is what is the product going for? If the product is just going to, for example, to provide electricity to the regular population that is subsidized by the state, it's difficult to make some profit. But now, East Africa and the rest of us, we all have mining. Now, what do all the mining companies do? They go to the site where they do the mining, they build their camp, they bring the generators, they bring their equipment, and they isolate all that. Now, if you get together all the mining companies, because, again, that's the example that I'm thinking about, East Africa. You get all those mining companies, and you say, you are going to be prohibited to, again, prohibit, uh, or you're going to ask to work together. So you actually create a grid to be able to use that product. You know now that there is actually a group 
or, or infrastructure that is going to be receiving that product that you need. So they will be able to fund. So you need to be able to get a chain, and the chain needs to be from who bring the product, who transport it, and who is the um, beneficiary of it. So it has to be a full project. It's, it's not just uh, I build it, and, you, and, and when we finish, then we decide who pay it. From day one, you need to be able to make sure that all the party, all the chains, are benefit from it. So that's, again, like I said, it's project by project uh, basis to be able to, 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 to think about it. So uh, the, the best thing that I can say is that, like I said, the, the, the end users are the ones that are creating in the future generate fund generators to be able to fund the project. So uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, the landlocked country, Burkina Faso. Everybody will say Burkina Faso, well, uh, there is lack of electricity, they are developing countries, have nothing. But Burkina Faso have huge mining activity, huge mining industries, they have bigger processing of gold on the rest. But each one of those companies have their own generators. Each one of those companies are buying fuel in Accra, in Abidjan, in Togo, and they have hundreds and hundreds of trucks with diesel going from the port all the way to Burkina Faso. Now, if you get all those companies together, you say, listen, we're going to stop all that. We're going to build a grid, and you are going to be using the electricity of this project of the grid. All of them, they'll say, you know, why should we do that? Cheaper electricity. But you need to make sure that the, the companies know that the grid is going to be built, the generator at Accra or in Abidjan are going to be built, and then they will have that electricity. So, so again, that, that funds will be done because the banks or whoever is funding, they're going to be asking the same thing. You know, who is going to be the one paying for this? So if you do a project like that, and I'm speaking now something that I know a little bit, and you tell them that, listen, you build the generator, you do the grid, and the mining companies in Burkina Faso we pay the electricity, I can guarantee you that whoever is doing that, they will know because they are processing mining and whoever knows what in Burkina Faso have. For, to do mining, you need a lot of electricity. Mm -hmm. So, so I, my answer is that you need to structure a, a business that the end user, and usually the end user, you have to remember that the electricity, the, the, the population use electricity is not as much as the industries. So, so my answer will be is that how do you structure, but the end user is the one who actually makes sure that you will be able to, or the project be bankable. Uh, and, and that's yeah. my answer. Professor, okay. what I've always liked about you is that you always talk about value in something. I, I think that's very important. You're not just building and, and taking it away to be, to be processed. This is where I just wanted to bring, and then I'll come to you, Dr. I mean, I wanted to bring um, engineer in, because when engineer was showing some of those slides, I knew, I knew Dr. Min was excited as well as you, Professor. When we're seeing, you know, increase in oil, increase in gas, I said, okay, uh, COP26 has nothing over you guys. So, um, engineer, <laughs> what, what, what can you add from what uh, the two ministers have told us? Um, thank you very much. Um, one thing we must go home with, first of all, is that oil will play a significant role in the African energy mix. It will retain its share, the highest share, over all other forms of energy in the long term. But we also need to know that to meet the demand of the over 600 million people without electricity, and 900 million people without access to clean cooking, Africa must do this in a modern way. We do not want to solve one problem and create another problem. Africa needs to also live in a healthy environment. Her citizens need to live in a healthy environment. Another thing that Africa should note in order for the world to take us seriously is that we must have a clear mandate, a clear mandate, one voice, on how we are going to be meeting our emissions targets to meet global standards. China has said by 2060, 
they will, that they will attain carbon neutrality. A lot of other countries are doing that. Europe, it's, uh, it's Europe, if you're, Europe fit for 55, I put theirs for uh, 55, uh, 2055. But Africa needs to do this as well. We need to have one voice and send our message to the world that we have a clear mandate regarding energy uh, emissions. Yeah. And I also like what the two speakers said about diversification. And it, uh, the demand for fossil fuel in Africa will continue to rise, but the structural way in which we produce and consume this energy would have to change. We must diversify. We must invest in petrochemical industries. We must invest in technology, research and technology. It has been shown that crude oil can produce over 80 byproducts. We can use our fossil fuel for this judiciously. We can improve industrialization that will translate into social economic development. We can do so many of these things if we sit down together and project the future together, not individually. Uh, uh, finally, Africa will continue to be relevant to the world if, like I said, again, it gets itself prepared for the world. Now, Europe is saying in the long term, they are going to be using hydrogen as their own transition fuel. We can provide, we can get ready with technology to get those hydrogen so that the time they need it, we have it. So they will continue to be dependent on us. So I think Africa, if we jointly hold our hands together, we'll be able to go far to achieve this, our set goals and targets. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Engineer. I think it's really important, and I think all of us in this industry agree that uh, production of our resources has to be done in a very, very sustainable manner. And I think we need to keep shouting at that. And I'm also in agreement when you talked about R&D and innovation. And I wanted uh, uh, Dr. Amin to maybe touch on that, because innovation is something that I think is a, a critical and a driver to how we can... Um, you know how we can we can push push our resources. I'm not I'm not in agreement that it, it, when you say Africa should speak in one voice, I see this as always being very regional. We may speak in one voice here, but I think because of the the size of our countries and and uh, for example, nobody here is speaking about geothermal. I won't even go to it. You know, Kenya is number one in geothermal, number nine in the world. Um, so th there are things that are very unique to us and the things that we can do together. But I think innovation is really one area that can cut across. Dr. Min, you Well, I, I think that innovation is, is important because if you look at the structure of our energy industry, we have technology that is aging. We are not able to uh, improve on the efficiency of our energy systems including uh, the refineries and other uh, petrochemical facilities that we have because we have not invested in innovation. And this is where I think that funding becomes challenging because you just cannot have the innovation that you need if you don't invest in research and development. Where is the money going to come from? We have depended on the developed world to support the financing of our research and development for too long, for far too long. We have to find our own ways of doing this. There are examples of how African countries have generated money to finance very significant interventions. If you recall the establishment of the OPEC fund, for development. There are African countries, such as Nigeria, Angola, that decided that 4% of their production should go into the fund to be used to support non-producing countries. And this has worked so well. Again, if you look at 
the new petroleum industry law Nigeria has just passed, the law has created a fund that will be used to finance Nigeria's exploration in frontier areas. Because they have come to terms with the fact that financing for fossil projects may not be forthcoming you know, over the next decade because of the, the, the energy transition. And Nigeria has positioned itself. I think that all the producers in Africa can equally come together. If we've done that with OPEC, we can do that with Apple. And I'm looking forward to Apple taking that center stage in getting all the producers to create Africa Opportunities Fund. A certain percentage of their production should go to this fund, and we can use that to finance our infrastructure. Ghana's uh, petroleum hub, for example, is going to cost us about 60 billion US dollars over the 25 year period that we want to, to build it to the fullest. If we can pool resources together to develop this uh, 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 hub, which will serve the entire region, we would have created value through our own contributions for our economy. And so doing it together, I, I think, is the, is the way out. As for looking for financing from the capital market, whether in our domestic economy or in foreign economies, we will continue to face challenges. Because the reality is that the risk of investment in Africa is still high. The reward is not as much as investors may be looking for. I have seen this data on the risk reward index by Fish Solutions. That shows that the risk reward index in Africa is, is low, as low as 40.5 uh, out of 100. Suggesting that the reward is, is less, but the risk is high. And so we can improve on the investment climate by reducing the risk of investment. We still have political instability. We still have insecurity issues. I mean, over the last one week or so, you're talking about terrorist attacks in Mali, you know. And, and this is not good for Africa's image. I do know of, um, you know, insecurity issues in other, on other continents. But we in Africa do not need insecurity because we are so deprived and therefore we should be able to address all these issues that are militating against our environment in order for us to attract the needed investment. So much as we can mobilize resources from within, we cannot do without the partnership of the global uh, marketplace as far as raising uh, uh, the needed uh, financing for our development, including the financing of uh, uh, research and, and, and development. Thank you. Thank you. Professor, um, the other professor, Dr. Min, spoke about uh, security. And you know that's an issue that touches everywhere across. It'll be very interesting to know how you in Equatorial Guinea are able to contain it. And in that context, um, what can fast track the creation of an investor friendly environment to accelerate energy infrastructure development? And I'll, I'll look at your, I'll look at Equatorial Guinea for that. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, thank you for the question. Um, I'm going to make a little comment about, um, you already mentioned COP26, climate okay. change. Oh, yes. Um, again, sometimes I'm called a bad professor. Okay. I'm a bad minister because I support fossil fuel in Africa, and I have not a problem. I don't have to apologize. But I, I say this for one key thing, and I think this is very important. One needs to understand, and this is what we're saying about speaking one voice. What are the priorities for Africa? The priority for um, Europe and North America and Asia is different than ours. I'll give you an example. We have this protester who came here about fossil fuel. We have this famous girl, uh, Grecia. He's screaming all the time. Get this professor of Grecia two weeks without electricity or having to work two weeks because there is no fuel. I can guarantee you that her priority are going to change. He's not going to be thinking about, I want good air. He will think, I want electricity because I want to see my television. 
I want to charge my mobile. So that's our situation. What's the priority of Africa? We want electricity. Now, just imagine south of Germany or north of France, two weeks without electricity. I can guarantee you that they will have more terrorist attack than Mali and all Africa together. Vandalists, they will be in the street. Just imagine with the lockdown, they already will have riots in Europe. Just imagine two weeks, a European city without electricity. That's the answer of security. Mm -hmm. We do not provide electricity to our people. They don't have jobs. They cannot move around. They cannot do a lot of things. So for us, if we don't provide them that fuel, then there will be problems. So that really answers why we have the pirates in Somalia. Because they, are, they have no electricity there. They are coming fishermen from different places, stealing their fish. So what alternative do we have? Jump there. So what we are having in West Africa is the same thing. You have in Nigeria, you have in Cameroon, you have in that you have community that have no electricity, they have problems. So what the only alternative that they have? They have to find some way to feed their family. So clearly the issue about our resources is what is the priority for Africa? And our priority is to give electricity to our people, is to give fuel to our people and to give jobs to them. The Europeans already have the electricity, they already have the fuel, they already have the jobs. That's why for them, their priority is different than ours. When they needed electricity, they build nuclear plants. Everybody knows that nuclear plants are very dangerous, but they build it anyway. Why? Because they needed electricity for the people. Now, if they want, that, what they can do is say, okay, stop fossil fuel, come to Africa and build nuclear plants for us, so we all have electricity. We'll be happy to do that. But our priority right now is to be able to give electricity. And I say all the time, those people who are protesting, give them two weeks without electricity or having to walk from their house all the way to the school or to buy, you will see how the priority change. So again, that comes in the problems that we have electricity, the problem we have insecurity, because you cannot do a lot of things. You have the little welder who wants to do their work, that they cannot do it because they need to buy a generator. And the generator wants to be the fuel. Why? Because they have no electricity. So clearly, I need to focus on what's the priority of my people, satisfy it, and then I can think about the other ones. When the, in, what do you call it, the, the industrial revolution was happening in the UK, everybody knows that they were polluting, everybody knows it was bad, but what, the, what was the priority? Create jobs. So clearly at this moment is they need to understand what's our priority right now. If they have satisfied theirs, that's fine. When we satisfy now, then we will decide to, to do our renewal. That's why I say that Africa needs minimum 20 or 25 years for us to do this uh, uh, energy transition. Professor, I'll tell you, if you ever have the, the opportunity to go to a rural area and switch on a one light bulb, and you hear a mother tell you that this is the beginning of, of uplifting my family, it brings you to tears. So I, I know exactly where you're coming from. And I think this is a good point, if I may, just to um, turn to our, our audience and see if we can get any questions. Because I know this is fantastic. We could be here all night. Uh, questions, please, from the audience? May we take some questions? As always, please may make it short and concise. Thank you so much. Just gentlemen, turn in yourself. Thank you. Please feel free. Thank you. Um, my name is Gerd, Gerd G. I'm the managing director of Career Energy. Um, it is a new independent in the block. Uh, my question is directed to uh, His Excellency uh, President Lima. Um, you have the honor, you've been given the name uh, professor for the good work you're doing. Um, I think that in here there is something else which maybe the crowd doesn't really know. Uh, which I, will, I had the opportunity to be a part of, and that is the creation of, of human resources capital in the country. Um, I had the opportunity, someone tapped me in your team to help them uh, develop the curriculum for your technical uh, institute in EG. Um, one of the things which knocked me off is when we began working and she said, the minister has specifically said the resources required to train the people must come from Africa. Uh, to me, that was astonishing. Uh, the other thing which uh, we got was that 
you wanted to develop Africans to work in the oil and gas industry and equally mining. The, the third thing is that you were very specific with regards to strategic human resources management because I think that is what we tend to miss. So my question to you, um, uh, His Excellency, what would you advise the other countries, because I know you traveled to Cameroon to also pick the brains of some of the people who worked in Cameroon industry. What would be your advice with regards to regional creation of the talent which is required, especially taking into consideration the transition we're facing in the next 25 years? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question, and, and thank you for reminding me about what I said about the thinking, and, and it's true. I do believe, and you, you, you touch a very important resource, that when people talk about resources, they think it's also about minerals, oil, and gas. Africa has a more important resource, that is the human resources. We have been for decades training our young men and women for all different trades. And you could imagine how many people we have trained for oil and gas. And you know what they're telling them right now? You should do hydrogen. No, I said, what do I know about that? <laughs> Nothing. I know about oil, I know about power. So you have been, we have been training all these people to run refineries, to do petrochemics, even to be, well, but now they bring a new technology that we have no idea about it. They bring the wind, so, what do you call it, the, the wind solar, no? What do I know about that? No. Uh, the panel solar, then they have these guys from Spain, Germany, we have all this technology, the Koreans, and then now is the new one, is the container that is the hydrogen. And I ask, I'm a minister of resources, I have no idea how it works. And even, in, and, but all my people have been trained for oil and gas, have been trained to run FPSO, have been trained to put electricity and run with oil, gas, minerals. So now you are telling me that the bright people that I had been training for all these years to do this, I need to tell them, by the way, all your high school, university that I send you is a waste because now you need to go back for a new technology and resource that I have no idea how it works. Who owns that technology? I don't own it. I remember one thing that uh, I think it was the president of the Chinese Africa Chamber told me. Excellency, the trick is owning the technology. If you have the technology, mm -hmm. then you can own the resource. When you don't own the technology, you are under the mercy of them. And if I have no idea how the hydrogen work, I will never own the resource. But you know, nobody can come and tell me how oil is a drill, process, and sell right now. Because I'm an expert in oil, and I've been trained by my industry. So all those young people that have been trained in Equatorial Guinea, in Cameroon, they need to be able to work and have a job on what they have been trained. And they have been trained to be able to exploit our resources, oil, gas, and minerals. And some of them have been trained for marketing for the rest. So just imagine, after hydro, they said, no, don't use hydro anymore. Now we got nuclear. Who in Equatorial Guinea is going to be nuclear? Change again. So our human resources are very important. We have very bright uh, young men and women uh, that are trained. We just finished, last week we opened the new Institute of uh, Technical Institute of Mining, the first one in Equatorial Guinea. Every single professor is from Cameroon. They are all PhD and master. And the only thing I did was went to Cameroon and I did a survey and asked for all these professors and people in Cameroon willing to come and being able to teach our institute. And they were, you will be amazed how many Cameroonians with PhD, doctor of mining. And we selected these seven. And these guys are right now training in Equatorial Guinea in English about mining. And one of the things that we will do in the mining in Equatorial Guinea is that every single mineral resource in Equatorial Guinea will not be exported in brut. It will be processed in Equatorial Guinea itself. And one will ask, how we'll do that? With the people that we are training right now, then we'll know how to process the gold, we'll know how to process the bauxite to be able to do it. So the, the, the issue about the human resources, and I thank you for reminding me about that, 
is our biggest asset that we have in Africa. It's not the oil, it's not the, it's not the oil, it's not the, the gas, it's not the mineral, it's the human resources because we have the young people, trained people, that I'll tell you one thing that it's what happened all the time. A lot of those are being called to be able to work in Europe, North America, Asians, and little by little, all the investment that African countries have done for those training, they are leaving because the job that they were supposed to be doing in Africa, they cannot do it anymore because that resource cannot be used. So that's a little bit on my point of human resources. We should do what the technology that actually we know and we have been training our people. But believe you me, uh, Professor, His Excellency, it's an issue that you're even seeing in America. So people have to be retrained, and it's, we just have to be innovative, think outside the box what we need to do. Dr. Min, I haven't forgotten you. What, what's your take? I, I, I think that uh, human resource development is central to our journey to develop our resources because as the West is leaving our oil and gas industry, I'm very sure that they are also going to take away a uh, lot of human capacity. Uh, but our approach to human resource development for the oil and gas industry in the past has not helped us. We focused in the past on training petroleum engineers, geologists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the oil industry is multidisciplinary. In fact, if we are to train them to gain meaningful employment, most of the jobs, the valuable jobs, are at the stage of development of the oil fields. The development of the oil fields, the building of the FPSOs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are not areas petroleum engineers and geologists will find comfort with. But that was the approach to training people for the oil and gas industry. And so today we know that we need to train them in other disciplines, welding, electronics, mechanics, etc., etc. Because these are the people who are needed when you are building the FPSOs, when you are developing the oil works. And this is why local content hasn't been successful in most of our countries. And so in Africa, you still have the Filipinos that are dominating the development phase of oil uh, fields. You see them still dominating when Nigeria decided to do uh, FPSO in Lagos. I can tell you, about half or more of the workers <laughs> came from outside. And so we need to be able to expand our curriculum for the oil and gas industry to cover all these areas. But again, it's going to be difficult to train people who will not have opportunity to practice what we train them to do. I have expected that the oil and gas companies, wherever they operate, would take trainees from Africa to those projects so that they are exposed to the industry and other jurisdictions. When they come home, they come better prepared. They come better exposed. This many of them do not do. Because our local content laws and the petroleum agreements that we sign provide for them to take on local people in their operations in the country. But I think that the, the, the rationale behind this is not just for them to be trained in the country. Mm -hmm. But where such companies have operations in other jurisdictions, whether in the UK, in the US, in Russia, that opportunity should be available for our local people to be taken there for the training. This is the kind of inclusive approach that we need to give the skills that our people need. Let me add that when I was talking about innovation and research, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. there is one thing we have been missing for some time. Norway, when Norway decided that they were going to develop their industry, they passed a law that all companies that operate in Norway should conduct their research 
in Norwegian institutions. And that compelled these companies to build the capacity of those institutions to be able to do that research and to achieve their research results. How about us? We have institutions that train people five years, seven years, and when they come out, we say they have to be trained and retrained and retrained and retrained. You are not going to use all your life being trained and retrained and retrained. The institution should have the capacity to churn out people who can enter industry direct without having to go through several years of training before they can derive value from that training. This is the approach I think we have to follow. We also need to start it from the base. Science and mathematics training should be emphasized in our primary schools, in our senior high our schools, in our universities. So that when they come out, that it takes relatively lesser time to expose them to industry. They easily will adjust. And then they will start driving value uh, right from there. And so this is the approach I think we need to give to uh, the training. And not just what we have done in the past. We have many you know, petroleum engineers and geologists. And when you do exploration, how long does it take you to do exploration? After three years or two years when there is uh, a discovery, what, what would they do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the next phase is the development of the field. The next phase is developing the infrastructure, subsea infrastructure, FPSO. Where are the people to do this for us? And so this is the way I think we, sh we, we, we should go. We're talking about developing the steel industry in Africa. If oil is going away, as they say, how about the, the, the potential that we have to develop the iron and steel industry. This we need to do so that we can manufacture FPSOs in Africa. But again, are we going to bring the Filipinos and the Chinese, etc., to come and develop the FPSOs in Africa? No. So this is where we start from. And, and I think that that should be able to address the, the capacity challenges that our industry has faced for a long time now. I think both of you, Excellencies, have shown that um, the human resource is really the, the, the big, the big uh, kahuna, if I may say, in, um, <laughs> in that equation. I, I wanted to invite him to Ghana because we have established the Accelerated Oil and Gas Capacity Program in Ghana, which seeks to achieve exactly what I have talked about. And the approach that we are using is, is the all-inclusive, all-comprehensive approach to developing human capacity. And so, uh, Gabriel, as we have done uh, over and over, you are invited to Ghana. We can share experiences, we can share lessons, so that we can look at Africa as a continent and not just as individual countries. I'll go with institute or with our institute. Eh? <laughs> I just want to, I just before we'll, we'll close up, I don't think there's any more questions, but I wanted to say, and I thought this was, I have to say this. I was in a conference in Uganda, His Excellency, uh, the President Obiang was there, sitting with um, His Excellency Museveni. And he stood up, and the first thing he said to him was, Stop training petroleum engineers. Everybody went quiet. <laughs> they were like, What? Because you have people in Aberdeen everywhere training. And he was asked, they asked him why. We need petroleum engineers. He said, no, 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 no. And it's exactly what you said. We call it TVET. You need the polytechnic type uh, training, more of that. There are too many engineers running around. But I wanted to leave it at that. Um, your, apologies. Your, your uh, sorry. Uh, yes, go thank ahead. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, we are unfortunately running, uh, sorry, 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 running out of time. Um, so we have to take one question, a brief one. I would like to reiterate that please may we keep our question brief and please, Your Honorable Excellencies um, and Irene, please may we keep our responses brief and then there afterwards I'll need to take a quick announcement before we part ways. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Pinto from Angola. And then I have no exactly a question just to thank for the audience and for the, 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 the audit. So I'd like to ask for the ladies to make a presentation, His Excellencies, when we can take the outlook that was presented on board. Thank you. 
think that's for you, engineer. Irene. Okay, if I understand your question, you mean you want the book, the publication? Okay, yeah, it's just if you go to our exhibition stand right there, we have uh, copies, uh, both for uh, the, uh, the annual outlook, the short-term market report, uh, our statistical bulletins, everything you find at the stand. Um, Elizabeth, may I kindly please take over? So yes. there's, there's one more um, question left. Um, as mentioned, please make it brief, sir. All right. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Um, I don't have a question. I just have um, a few clarifications to make. I'm uh, Dr. Omar Farouk Ibrahim, the Secretary General of the African Petroleum Producers Organization, APO. Uh, virtually everybody on the table there, on the high table, has uh, said something about APO. Three quick observations. One, we cannot succeed in uh, local content the way we have done in the past. Africa must begin to see local content in the context of the continent, not as national states. We can succeed. The, the industry is a very capital intensive industry. Some countries have made a lot of success, others are just coming in and we don't have much time. That's number one. Number two, finance. We've been told, where is the money coming from? Believe me, we have the money in Africa. Let me give you two good examples. Last year, about this time, our countries were making their budgets. I doubt if any country projected beyond $40, 50 for, 20, for this year in terms of oil price. Today, it is 80-something. What are we doing with that difference of 30 or $35? The same thing happened between 2002 and 2008. From 2003, oil prices were about 20, 22, 25. By 2008, oil price was 150. What did we do with all that money? So seriously speaking, we can, if we have the will, get the money from within. Between last year and this year alone, we are going to have an excess of about 40, 45 billion in terms of oil income compared to what we had projected or budgeted. So if you make 35 to 40 billion in a year, and you decide that maybe, okay, 15 billion should be spent, which you haven't budgeted for, you still have 50, uh, another 20 or so billion. We have the money. All we need to do is to set our priorities right. The question of energy is a question of national security for our countries. To me, all these talks about energy transition is ideological. The moment the Arabs in 1973 decided to embargo oil to some Western countries, these countries decided that we cannot, we cannot and we must not allow ourselves to go through this again. So I've always said from 2003 to 2008, when the price of oil was going up, it wasn't just demand. The industry was being manipulated in order to allow for shale oil to succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So sorry. Thank you so much, Doctor. And with that being said, I would like to make a quick announcement. But before I make a quick announcement, um, I am very, very honored and thankful uh, for Your Excellency's participation on this panel. Thank you so much, Irene, for your presentation. Elizabeth, you're amazing as always. Thank you to the technical team. So we are wrapped up with day two. Amazing. I just want to make a quick announcement that there will be... Um